All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Good to see everyone here today. And uh, we are on our 10th week of our study in the book of Philippians. And so uh, today we're going to come to a, a fun passage um, and really is a, a, a great, great passage in uh, chapter four of Philippians. Um, just so you know, what we have is next week will be the last week in our study. So next week, we'll look at the end of chapter four and we will wrap up um, uh, the study next week. I'm, I if we have questions or comments, I might have like a little call in thing. If people have questions, uh, just sort of put a bow on everything the following week. But basically next Wednesday, we'll be done with our study on Philippians. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a break. And then what I'm going to do is um, uh, probably sometime uh, in August or September, what I'm going to do for the fall is rather than doing a, another Bible study, what I'm going to do is something a little bit different. But I, I feel I feel strongly about this and excited about it. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to do a study a little bit about what's happening with our country with um, with race and and how we're called to treat people. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up about uh, a number of interviews. I've got um, quite a few African American friends that I'm close to, and I've already got some calls. Several of them, all of them, are Christians. Uh, some of them are political people that are community leaders back in, in Illinois. Uh, some of them are pastors. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to do a series of interviews about some of their experiences and talk about their experiences with what they see and where, where do they see God in the midst of all this dialogue in our country right now. So uh, just some, some voices to help us hear what's going on and try to process from the Bible all, all these conversations we're hearing uh, about race and sort of how to navigate them. So that's what we're going to do for the fall. And it will not be, like I said, a specific Bible study, but each week I'm asking these individuals to share um, you know, uh, what they believe God is doing right now in, in the midst of all this and to share some scriptures that are speaking to them in the midst of it. So it'll be more of an interview, hearing some biblical passages that are speaking to them and to hear some of their perspectives that they're, that they're uh, seeing um, and, and have lived through as we think about just race in America. And the goal here is not to try to, um, to present solutions because it's a very complex issue, but rather the goal in this uh, fall series that I'm going to do is just to be able to hear some stories and experiences because I feel like um, part of what we are called to do as Christians is to see people as individuals. And it's very hard to do that by just watching the news or getting things on Facebook or, you know, on the internet. But when I talk to people I know and I hear their stories and I'm able to process their experiences and sort of their perspectives, it helps me to better contextualize what's happening and what God may be saying to me in the midst of all this. So that's the plan for the fall. Okay. And uh, so we'll end this next week and then we'll take a little bit of a break. And then the end of August, 1st of September, we'll start this. Uh, I haven't decided what I'm going to uh, entitle it yet, but this idea of just seeing the world through others' eyes and uh, just evaluating where we are as a culture right now and where is God in the midst of all these different dialogues that we're, uh, that we're seeing. Okay. So that's the plan. With that being said today, we're in Philippians chapter four. And uh, last week we talked about conflict with Eodia and Syntyche in verses one through three. And then I touched on verses four and five, and that's where we're going to pick up today. So in verse four, Paul says, uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And so we've talked about this idea that rejoicing, joy is something Paul has talked about throughout his letter. Uh, we often think of joy as a reaction to circumstances, and it can be that. But oftentimes, uh, choosing to rejoice is a choice that we make. We choose to look for the positive and to celebrate uh, what God is doing as opposed to uh, just responding to, uh, to what we have in front of us. So Paul says, rejoice in the Lord, even though he's in jail. And then I will say it again, rejoice. I remember when I was a young Christian, there was a chorus, you know, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. That always makes me think about that. And then he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. And uh, once again, that's just a great verse because Paul, after talking about the conflict between Eodia and Syntyche, he reminds us that as Christians, regardless of what our doctrine is, regardless of how pure our doctrine is, Jesus was explicitly clear that what makes us different, what the world needs to see is not what we believe, it's not what we say, but it's what we do. And Jesus said, to love God and to love your neighbors, you love yourself as the greatest commandment. So gentleness is clearly a part of that. Um, 
reminds me of what I'm seeing right now. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how many people I've heard say and, and read, you know, I love everybody, you know, <laughs> I love everybody. And, um, but first John says, let us not love in word and in speech, but in deed and in truth. Love is measured in our actions, how we treat people. It's not what we say or what we think, how we feel about ourselves. So Paul here says, let your gentleness be evident because these two women that are fighting, it's splitting the church, uh, potentially splitting the church. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Let people see your actions. And then he says, the Lord is near. And then I said last week that I don't believe he's talking about the end. I think he's reminding the people that God is present in the midst of their circumstances. And then we get to what we're going to talk about today. And today is really, um, uh, I'm going to talk to you about three steps for dealing with anxiety, dealing with stress. Uh, this passage is one of the more uh, famous ones in the Bible that actually talks about the subject of stress, talks about the idea of anxiety. It's mentioned multiple places in the Bible. Um, and it's clearly something that people wrestled with in biblical times and we still wrestle with today. A few years ago, I was doing a, uh, a sermon and Amazon used to put on books, they would tell you exactly how many books they had in a category. This was probably 10 years ago. And I did a search on, um, on books on stress. And at that particular time, this was before internet books actually blew up, they had over 5,000 books that were specifically dedicated only to the topic of stress. And when you look at the subject of anxiety, you look at the subject of, uh, of, uh, of, of stress and nervousness and these kind of things, there's obviously just an abundance of books everywhere you turn, they're out there because people are looking for answers in how to manage stress, how to deal with anxiety. Um, sometimes anxiety can be a product of physiology. Uh, we know uh, through, through brain imaging and things like that, that some people, the way their chemicals are in their brain, that they're more prone to anxiety and to fear issues. And, uh, but sometimes anxiety, sometimes stress is self-imposed. And, and I think that we make a big mistake when we try to, to say that anxiety is either a, it's always, um, you know, the whole nurture or nature. Well, it's just the way that I am. I'm a worrier, just who I am. And so some people don't take any responsibility and they want to be able to justify all their anxiety or they, um, they just want a pill to be able to fix it. But there's also an element where, yes, sometimes um, there are behavioral things that we can do to try to help minimize our anxiety and take responsibility for it. So it is both nature and nurture that take place. Some of it is chemical and physiologically in our brain. Some of it, though, are ways that we've conditioned ourselves to think, ways that we've conditioned ourselves uh, that actually feed anxiety in our life. And to that end, Paul today gives some brilliant and beautiful words that talk about how to address anxiety, how we do have a measure of control over the anxiety that we feel and we experience in our life. Now, as I said, it's not just as simple as saying, we'll do these three things and it's all going to go away because there are other factors involved. The size of the problems in our life, once again, our mental health, uh, but these are choices that we make that Paul's going to talk to us about today. And here's three things we're going to discuss in this passage in Philippians. First of all, Paul says, worry about nothing. Second of all, he says, pray about everything. And the third thing he says is think about the right things. All right. And if you can memorize those three things, I will tell you firsthand, when I began to look at this passage maybe 20 years ago and, and began to really meditate on it, those three things have spoken to me countless times over the past two decades. Worry about nothing, pray about everything, and think about the right things. And that's what we're going to talk about today, okay? So let's first of all look at verse number six. And I'm going to go ahead and pull it up here and uh, pull it up on the screen. And Jim, can we open more in prayer? We sure can. Yep. <laughs> Let's, uh, would you mind saying an opening word for us, Danielle? Sure, no problem. Uh, God, we thank you for this group and their diligence to come back, um, even as the circumstances of the world get crazy. God, um, we thank you for Jim and his, um, uh, his insights into your word and uh, help us to be open to what uh, you have to say to our hearts. Um, help us to we recall this for ourselves so that um, as we deal with our own anxieties, we can 
um, turn to your words and help us to recall this for those that need it um, so that we may be a comfort to others as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So here we go down and we say, Rejoice, Lord, always. The Lord is near. And then in verse number six, Paul simply says, Do not be anxious about anything. All right. So it's once again a verse worth online. Do not be anxious about anything. So um, once again, Paul himself was facing persecution, right? He's in jail or at least under house arrest during this time. Uh, there's thought that maybe the church is facing some persecution, but we don't know. There's disturbances in the church. We know between the ladies, Yodians and Teki, there's a bit of a, a division there taking place. Um, there are false teachers. We read about those in chapter number one that are bringing division and trying to lead people astray. So there are things to be concerned about. And the reason that Paul's writing his letter is because he does have concern. He has concern for the church as he has for all the churches. In, in the book of um, uh, 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, I have, I have concern, daily concern for all the churches, uh, pressure from without and pressure from within. And so here, um, Paul is saying here, these things are worthy of concern, but he's saying they're not worthy of worry. The word anxiety here is translated worry. It's translated uh, troubled or fretful. The, the Greek word literally means, in the Greek, it means to be pulled apart or to be pulled in different directions. So oftentimes when Paul says, do not worry about anything or do not have anxiety, the word here, it speaks about having our minds pulled in multiple different directions. And this feeds worry. When our, when our brain sort of goes to all these different scenarios and we're trying to think and we're trying to control our environment and we're worried about all these things that could happen or potentially will happen. Uh, this is what it means. In the old English, uh, the word worry spoke about being strangled. And the idea is because our problems and we allow these things to happen, they, 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 uh, they, they come upon us and they, they sort of uh, strangle our mind. Uh, worry though, Paul says, do not worry about anything. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be concerned. If the doctor says, well, you know, uh, our test revealed this. Um, if you get laid off from your job, there are things that are worth being concerned about. But Paul says, don't worry about them. Don't fret about them. Don't spend excessive time, you know, trying to think about all these different scenarios to where you're, 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 you're bottled up on the inside. Now, here's the thing about worry that's very important. Worry changes nothing. Yeah. Listen to me. Worry changes nothing. You can sit in your home and pick out any issue you want. Finances, economy, politics, nation, uh, kids, grandkids, health. Pick out whatever you want. And you can sit down all day and you can worry about it for 12 hours and it will change nothing. Now, when you are concerned about something, there may be actions. Maybe I can do something. Maybe I can, you know, if I'm concerned about money, maybe I can uh, save aside or cut back or put together a budget. I can uh, rearrange my portfolio. There are things you can do if you're concerned about it. But to sit there and actually fret about it and to worry about what is shoulda, coulda, or what might be or what could be, to think about what happens if, if, if you know, what's going to happen if the economy tanks, what's going to happen if they don't get a vaccine what's going to happen if this when you start thinking about all the scenarios that could happen it will change absolutely nothing several years ago i, I read a study and I, I didn't have time to look it up but it was a it was one of the most detailed studies ever done on worry and what they came back and they said and I'm, I'm not going to get these numbers 100 percent correct but what they said is when they surveyed these people did this intense lengthy survey they found that 78 percent of the things that people worried about never actually occurred mm -hmm. think about that three out of four of the items that people worried and fretted about never actually came to be in other words they spent all this emotional time and energy worrying about stuff that never ever came to fruition then what they found is about 15% of the things that people worried about were things that actually did occur, but they never occurred to the extent that people thought they were going to occur to. In other words, the way they build it up in their mind, boy, this is going to be so horrible. It's going to fall apart. Everything's going to go. And this is going to, you know, you're thinking about worrying about all these worst case scenarios. 15% of the things that they worried about did in fact occur, but it was not nearly as bad as they thought it was going to be. The result of this study was this. 
only about seven to eight percent of the things that people worry about actually occur. And it only occurs to the extent that they actually think it's going to occur. So when we catch ourselves worrying about things, thinking about scenario, what's going to happen? What are they going to do? How is this going to work out? When we spend a lot of emotional time and energy fretting or thinking about these things, research shows that three out of four of them are never, ever going to happen. And then only about 15% of those things that are going to happen never happen as badly as we think they're going to be in our mind. And only about 5 to 8%, 7 to 8% of things we worry about actually occur to the extent that we, that, we, uh, that we think it could occur. So the point being that we have to remind ourselves, when Paul says, do not worry, he's not saying don't be concerned, but he's saying don't fret about these things because it's not going to change anything. Worry about nothing. Not only that, but uh, the Smithsonian Institute says that we are in the golden age of anxiety right now. And the reason they said we're in the golden age of anxiety is because we are dealing right now with what are, what are referred to as macro worries and micro worries. Micro worries are things that affect my life personally. They're very personal to me. Micro, small. It's intense about me, but we are exposed because of the internet, because of 24 hour news cycle, we are exposed to macro worries. So if, if, if something happens, if, if Syria or Iran try to bomb uh, uh, Israel, we hear about that in real time. Within minutes, we've heard about it. And then we're like, what's going to happen with Israel, right? So we're exposed to the world's problems and we're exposed to our own personal problems. Um, you know, there's a legend. I don't, I, 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 I've done a little research on it. I don't think it's 100% true. But the story is that on, on uh, July 4th, 1776, that King George wrote in his diary, nothing much happened today, right? But the story sort of plays itself out that, you know, that King George was so far removed and that it is true that what was so far removed that he had no idea what was happening back in America, right? Because you go back a couple hundred years ago, the length of time to hear something was so long. Now everything is instantaneous. So we're prone to these things that we have so much about us that we can worry about that we're exposed to between television, news, internet, and then our own individual problems with our family, our kids, our health, et cetera, et cetera. But Paul says, worry about nothing. And so with all that being said, let me give you two little key words are three, three specific ways to help you worry about nothing. All right. So if you're taking notes, give me three, three little hints here. First of all, as I told you earlier, is remember that most of the things you worry about are never going to happen. You have to tell yourself that you have to say, listen, I know that, that at least three out of four or four out of five, of the things I'm worried about are never, ever going to happen. You have to just remind yourself of that truth. The second thing is, is what's called the 100 year rule. And this has also been a blessing to me, mm -hmm. the 100 year rule. And the 100 year rule is this. When you find yourself worrying about something, ask yourself this, is it really going to matter in a hundred years? Is it really going to matter when I die and I go to heaven? Is this going to matter? Now there are some things that might matter, right? But is it really going to matter? Remind yourself in the big scope of history and the big overview of your life, is this really that important? And then the third thing is, is remind yourself of the principle to live one day at a time. It's about being present in the moment. Live in the moment. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, do not worry about tomorrow, Jesus said, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So worry about nothing, Paul says in verse number six, very clear about this. And I think ways we help, help us to worry about nothing is to say, remind ourselves, most of this that I think about is never going to happen. And if it does happen, it's never going to be as bad as I think it's going to be. Remind yourself that. Second thing is, remind yourself of the 100-year rule. Is this really going to matter 100 years from now? And then thirdly is try to live in the moment, live in the present. What's happening right now in front of me? What do I have control over? rather than trying to fret about what may happen tomorrow, the next day or next month. All right. So any questions or comments about that, but that's the first lesson Paul teaches us worry about nothing. Any comments, questions uh, on that?
just wave or put in the chat, bo chat box if you have a comment, a question about that. Hi, Bobby and Paul. Good to see you guys down there. All right. Anybody else? I see a hand. Nope. Danielle. Okay, go ahead. Uh, my father-in-law gives us gave us the advice about our for our marriage as the twenty-year rule of you know is it worth arguing about with your spouse and you know spending the time is it going to matter in twenty years kind of and uh, I think that as we you know start to think about oh what that was super petty even in our marriage we kind of put that same kind of context into it to try to you know. It's not worth it. It's not worth a marriage over. It's not worth my my emotional health over. That's excellent. Like I said, if you want to put together a 20 year rule, 50 year rule, 100 year rule, whatever it is, but you're right. It's trying to contextualize it and put it in the context of really the big picture of our life because we get so caught up in the moment and we fret about things that really aren't that important. I think we all know that. So that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? Comments, questions, or added thoughts you have about that issue of worry about nothing? Okay, down here, uh, Bev, can you unmute yourself, dear? Brian, there yeah. you go. Go for it. This has been back some years ago when Pastor Jim from um, Inspire Church spoke to us. Gene and I were on our journey with Alzheimer's, and he quoted this verse during his sermon. And so for every almost every day during that time, I would quote that, and it was such a blessing. Thank you for sharing that, yeah. And what a journey that is. And you talk about something that's a legitimate concern, because Bev, that's a legitimate concern when your husband has you know, Alzheimer's, and you're, you're dealing with this, seeing this person in front of you deteriorate and all the questions, that's a legitimate concern. And, uh, but at the same time, I appreciate you sharing about the battle of just sharing that verse and trying not to allow your mind to run wild because uh, it clearly can. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, let's move on to our second point then. So Paul says, worry about nothing, but I think it's important that, um, When we say worry about nothing, as you know as well as I do, that sometimes that isn't enough, right? It's like, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the whole adage, if I tell you, don't think about ice cream. You know, I don't want you to think about ice cream at all. Just sort of block it out of your mind. Don't think about what kind you like, chocolate, vanilla, don't think about ice cream, right? So if someone tells you, sometimes to say don't think about something doesn't just mean you can't think about it, right? You just, you still, your mind goes there. So Paul says, don't worry, but then he also gives us some positive and I think proactive things to do about it, okay? So instead of just saying, don't do this, sometimes we have to replace it with something positive. We have to replace it with something different that helps redirect our mind. So Paul gives us two proactive steps. And the first is worry about nothing, but then he says, second of all, pray about everything. Now in the comment section, Dorcas put down, I've been told that worry is actually a sin because it leaves God out of the issue. And, um, you know, I don't know if it's always a sin, but I think it can definitely be a sin um, because we're trying to bear things. We're holding on to things. And Paul addresses exactly what you said there. Worry about nothing, but then Paul says, pray about everything. Bring God into it. Now, if you've been with us on the weekends, we've been talking about this, right? We've been talking about Jeremiah the last couple of weeks where he lays these very raw, these, these vulnerable, transparent prayers at the feet of, of the Lord where he says in chapter 15, you're like a deceptive brook. I mean, he literally says to God, you, you have deceived me. You haven't held up your end of the bargain. You're, you're a mirage, a spring that doesn't provide water. He's venting on the Lord. And then in chapter 20, we read where he had the powerful prayer where he says, God, you deceived me and I was deceived. You overpowered me. You forced yourself upon me. Jeremiah teaches us about what it means to have a genuine, authentic, um, intimate relationship with God where we can share anything. And that means, as Paul reminds us, that means that we also can bring to God our cares and our concerns. We can tell God whatever we're thinking and feeling. And so he says this in chapter uh, number four, verse six and seven. Do not be anxious about anything, 
but in every situation. Now notice the word every situation. So anything that comes on our radar that causes us anxiety or fear or nervousness in every situation, and you should, should circle the word every, Paul says, uh, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, what's interesting here is when Paul says to pray about everything, what he does here is he mentions four specific words to talk about praying. So he says, in everything, don't just worry, but in everything that captures your mind in everything, I want you to pray. And he has four different words here. The first word is the general word for prayer. It just speaks about making a request to God in the New Testament. The second word, supplication. Now, supplication speaks of an earnest sharing or a pleading. It's a bit more intense. It's more of a pleading or a begging. It's, it's more of a, you know, sometimes we can pray trite prayers, you know, God bless me, give me a good day. Uh, Lord, help this to work out. But there's other issues that really we're very passionate about and we're very like praying more intensely. So Paul says, pray about everything with prayers and supplication. And then third, he says, with thanksgiving. So as we pray about our problems, we also need to be sure that we're offering gratitude and thanksgiving for the things we do have. Now, once again, this helps adjust our attitude, does it not? So if I'm concerned about something or I'm worrying about something, and when I pray to God and I say, Lord, um, I can pray and say, Lord, just help the situation to work out. That's a prayer. I can say, Lord, uh, I pray that you protect me from this situation or not let it be as bad as it is. I can do a prayer supplication. I can also say, God, I, in the midst of this problem, I want to thank you for A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I want to thank you for your provisions. I want to thank you for doing this. And oftentimes prayers of thanksgiving are also a way to redirect us. It's a way for us to see the good that we have in our life, even in the midst of this overwhelming burden, this overwhelming challenge that we're facing. Okay. And then the fourth word, um, he says with request, which speaks about, you know, just it, it is what it is with request. Now, I don't think that these four words um, are necessarily, we have to parse them in great detail. I think the key here is that Paul's trying to say to us is he's trying to emphasize the fact that we need to go before God and talk to God about this. So whatever it is, capture your mind, Paul says, don't worry about it. Don't fret on it. But then he says, redirect those thoughts and talk to God about it with prayers, with supplications, with thanksgiving, and with request, talk to God about it. You need to, to unload and give it to the Lord. Uh, the message says that when you pray, tell God every detail of your life. The message is a, is a, a paraphrase, but that's how it, it translates this verse. Jobs, car payments, ear infections, arthritis, uh, whatever it may be, we're to do it. F.F. Bruce says, a grateful remembrance of past blessings is a safeguard against anxiety in the future. And once again, when we're offering our request and our, request, um, our supplications, by giving gratitude and remembering what God's done for us is another way to help us navigate our challenges. First uh, Peter chapter five, verse seven says, give all of your worries and cares to God for he cares about what happens to you. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Psalm 50, 20 says, cast all your burdens upon the Lord. The point of all this is that Paul says, don't worry in front about it. But then he redirects us and says, I want you to pray about everything. And I think if we're honest, when we are in a loop of worry, um, I think that we will, most of us will acknowledge when we're really worried about something, we're thinking about it more than we're talking to God about it. Mm -hmm. Right? And so we think about it, we think about it, we think about it, it ruminates, it circulates in our mind. We're thinking, 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 all these scenarios, everything that could happen. But what Paul says is stop thinking so much about it. And when you catch yourself thinking about it, don't just say, don't think about it, don't think about it. But he says, redirect those thoughts and talk to God about it. And I just want to emphasize this again. If, you, if you've not heard the last two weeks at, at Palm West where I've talked about Jeremiah, these are very, very powerful messages not because I gave him, but because of what God did in Jeremiah's life and what Jeremiah taught us about being able to talk to God about anything and not being afraid to share things that, that, that we may feel are pity parties or um, maybe even things that, that we may be embarrassed to tell anybody else. 
God knows what we're thinking. He knows what we're feeling. And so we should be able to be transparent and come before him with that. So this is part of the process that Paul walks us through. Worry about nothing, pray about everything. And then the third thing is, once again, this is a proactive step. Paul says, think about the right things. In other words, what am I putting in my mind? I need to think about, I need to, need to ruminate. I need to intentionally be sure I'm feeding my mind good things. This was what I think, uh, what Bev shared beautifully about when her husband was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and was facing dementia and all the challenges of that. And so she said to us, you know, every day I had to remind myself of that verse. I had to read it. I had to memorize it. I had to say it over and over again. That's filling your mind with good things. It's filling your mind with the right things, with healthy things. Uh, there's been a multitude of studies, uh, thanks to uh, behavioral sciences and, and cognitive psychology. There's been a ton of research done over the last 50 years on this idea that what we think about affects our emotions and our attitude and also affects our behaviors. Uh, in computer terminology, have you heard this before? Garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you put bad things in, you're going to get, you're going to spit out bad things. When you put good things in, you're more likely to spit out good things. And so there's been all kinds of, of research done on this. Um, everything from violent video games in the lives of children to music people listen to to television programs. And what I said to you earlier about we are, we are completely engrossed right now in a culture of not just micro worries, but macro worries. Because, you know, you, I open up the news headlines on my cell phone and I turn on the news and it's just everything is negative and this and that. And it just, it's, we're constantly bombarded with this, with this negative stuff. Because let me tell you something, I think you know this, but, but the media right now, and I don't want to demonize all the media, but, but, but they're trying to get our attention. And what gets our attention is fear and anger and emotion. And so they're looking for the most extreme stories that's going to capture our attention and it's going to stir something up inside of us. And I'm going to say this, it's true for both the left and the right. All right. So no matter where we are on the political spectrum, and most of us are on the right side of the spectrum, but even people that we trust and listen to on the right, they're often also stirring us up because they're doing the same thing, just the opposite side. And it can be tit for tat, uh, whatever it may be. But the reality is everything that we're getting fed right now, almost everything, almost all of it is negative. It's meant to stir emotion inside of us, whether that emotion is fear or that emotion is anger. And so we have to be sure that we are filling our minds with something positive, something good, something that redirects our attention upon God. All right. Um, so let me just give you a couple of verses here. Uh, Proverbs 23, seven. Yes, sir. Uh, Proverbs 23, seven for as a person thinks in his, in his heart. So he is as a person thinks. So he is Isaiah 26, three, you will keep in perfect peace. All who trust in you and whose thoughts are fixed upon you. When I was a young Christian, um, I actually took that verse, Isaiah 23 or 26, three, and I actually wrote it on a three by five card and I put it on the headboard of my bed. And every night when I would go to bed, I would pray that prayer and I would read that verse out loud. Thou keeps in perfect peace the one whose mind is stayed upon him because in him does he trust. Um, and so when we keep our mind fixed upon the Lord, he does tend to give us peace. Um, so when we think about things, it's what are we, and when Paul says in the verse here, he says, think about these things. Um, he's talking about giving weight. You're giving weight. You're choosing to emphasize this. All right. So let's go back and let's look at these verses and then we'll talk about it. So verse number eight and nine, finally, brothers, what, and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now I'm going to sort of go through these words one at a time, but once again, I think the point of this is Paul's not saying these are eight specific things you have to focus on. I think he's trying to make a point of emphasis and he's trying to just give us some general categories. So first of all, think about these things that are true. He says, whatever is true, there are some things that are true and some things that are not true. The fact that this world is temporary, it's true. 
the fact that people are sinful and there's nobody outside of Jesus Christ that has lived a sinless life is true. I don't care who it is. I don't care what book you've read. I don't care who it is you watch on television. I don't care who your heroes are. Everyone is broken. Everyone's sinful. Christ is going to come back again. Love and forgiveness is what changes the world. I am loved by God, regardless of my sin. I do not have to perform or earn favor for God to love me, but because of Jesus Christ, uh, he takes pleasure in me. These are thoughts that are true and things that are true from the gospel perspective. We have to be sure we're thinking about those things. So let me just give you an example of how this plays itself out. The more insecure that we are, the more we can be gripped by anxiety. And at the core of, of, of a lot of people's battle that, that most people face is that we often wonder whether we're really truly lovable because we're aware of our sinfulness. We're aware of our failures. And so a lot of people struggle with the idea that, well, I've got to get my life cleaned up. I've got to be able to do really well. I've got to do this right. And then, then I'm worthy of being loved because a lot of us don't love ourselves unless we do or achieve certain things. The gospel is that you've been forgiven by, by the Lord and you are loved by him. I, I shared this in my morning call, my Sunday morning connection a couple of weeks ago with Brian. We were talking about this idea where when Jesus was baptized, the father spoke from heaven and said, this is my son whom I love and whom I'm well pleased. And we emphasize the fact that the Lord loved Jesus and said verbally, this is my son whom I love before Jesus ever did any public ministry. Didn't preach a sermon, didn't heal anybody, didn't go to the cross yet, but the father was pleased in who Jesus was, not what he was doing. Does that make sense? So this is an example of what is true. What is true is that I'm loved by God. What is untrue is I'm not lovable because I said these words because I think these thoughts because of something I did 20 years ago. I, I mean, it's amazing to me how many Christians I know who love the Lord that still carry shame and guilt over things they did 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. What is true? You have to focus on what is true, what the gospel says, what the Lord says about you. Second of all, what is noble? And now you may have some different translations for some of these words, but the word noble is uh, also translated honorable or serious. What's truly most important? Uh, also, he says, what is right? The word right here is what is just, what is fair. Um, you know, recently I saw a story of um, uh, in New York City about a young entrepreneur. And um, he was in his 30s. He was killed and dismembered by his 21-year-old personal assistant. Just a horrible story. And um, I, I was just thinking about what, what would this, this assistant thinking about to plan this thing to kill his boss? You know why he killed him? Because his boss gave him, uh, found out that the employee had stolen like $100,000 from him. And instead of firing him and turning him into the police, all he said to the employee that tried to steal $100,000 from him or did steal is, listen, you need to pay this back. He let the guy keep his job as his personal assistant, didn't turn into the police. And yet the personal assistant, in order to not pay the money back, killed his boss. It's just incredible. And I thought to myself, well, what are you thinking? Can you imagine how many thoughts, consuming thoughts that this guy had to have in his head to act on that? And so Paul says here, think about what is right. Think about what is just. And then he says, think about what is pure, what is innocent or what is blameless. What is lovely. The word lovely is also translated grateful or friendly. It's the only time this word appears, by the way, in the New Testament. Uh, what is admirable? What is commendable? Uh, think about what is excellent. The word excellent also is goodness. Uh, things that are really exceptional. And then he says, whatever is praiseworthy. The word praiseworthy is translated or it actually means applause or commendation. So think about the things that are worth being commended for. The things that we would clap for that really are worthy of that. So Paul says in all of these things, these are what I want you to think about, okay? Um, and once again, a little redundant here, but I love the fact that Paul says, listen, worry about nothing, but then he says, redirect your mind, pray about everything, and then fill your mind, choose to think about these things. 
Now, part of the way that we choose to think about what is good is we can write down verses on three by five cards. We can memorize Bible verses. We, um, we can write down a daily journal and we can choose to put things down um, that uh, put things down on cards or, you know, write out. I find that sometimes journaling prayers of gratitude can help us as well. But the idea is that we have to redirect our mind. Uh, Kim said here, redirecting our thoughts takes conscious effort. You, you're darn right about that. Just as living in the moment does. If we stay focused on all the things we have to be thankful for, uh, it allows us to truly live for today and not miss out on God's blessings. Beautiful. Exactly right. It's a conscious choice. And this goes back to what I said in my introduction. When we talk about anxiety, there is a nature element. Sometimes the chemicals in our brain can get off and it's very difficult to get them back. They can be, but it just doesn't, you don't just flick a switch. But there are other elements of anxiety that are self-taught. And that sometimes the way that we think, we condition ourselves to actually feed our anxiety. I don't have control over the brain chemicals in my brain very well, but I do have a lot of control over my choices. And it's not easy to redirect our thoughts. But when we do that, we're in a much, much healthier place. Okay. So anything else anybody wants to add, um, add to this, any other questions or comments before I give some closing thoughts on this? Jim? Yes. Um, I, I, one thought that I had was uh, to, when people are stressed is to say to them, have you uh, done a gratitude list lately? Which is basically what this is saying. And, and what was cool is I recently said that to a non-believer and, and he, he thought, Hey, yeah, I, I can do that. I mean, even, even as a, a non-believer, I mean, they can still focus on, uh, on just what they're grateful for, what they have. And that obviously takes them away from the stress. And the other comment that I want to make is, um, uh, you know, I, when you talked a few weeks ago, uh, back in chapter two, verse 28, where you talked about Paul saying when he was talking about uh, sending Timothy, I guess, um, and, and he said that uh, you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. And I really jumped on that verse when we were there couple of weeks ago because I, I made the comment that all I'd ever heard was Philippians 4 8 do not be anxious about anything so not to undermine what you've just said but no but, oh. um, but, but it, there is a balance you're 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 exactly right uh, and I'm trying to look it up right now because uh, the translation I pulled up no you're hundred percent correct the idea that we what we tend to do sometimes is we tend to idealize things and we act as though Paul was so spiritually never had any, any concerns, any sins, any worries whatsoever. He doesn't. He says, like you said, it will ease my anxiety. In, in the book of, um, of 2 Corinthians, uh, as I made mention earlier, Paul says, uh, you know, I have the daily anxieties from all the churches. Mm -hmm. I have pressure from without and pressure from within. Mm -hmm. So this idea that Paul never, ever wrestled with this is absolutely ludicrous. Paul understands it's a flesh and spirit battle that people go through. Mm -hmm. And and the idea that you become a Christian and all of a sudden, boy, I'm never going to have any worries. I'm never going to have, I'm just going to be a person of faith and boom, boom, boom. And listen, we're still flesh and blood. And so um, you're exactly right. And I think it does go back to, there is a distinction between concern and anxiety. There are certain things worthy of concern that we need to try to figure out that we need to take seriously. But this idea of, of anxiety is when it begins to take a hold of us. We no longer have control. It's like, it's in our mind. It's in our bodies. You guys know this. Uh, anxiety can affect our heart rate. It can affect our blood pressure. It can affect our sleep, right? So when we have too much anxiety, it feeds. Listen, Johns Hopkins has done tremendous research on this, talking about how unnecessary or extreme anxiety, how it affects us as human beings, how it shortens our life. And so Paul is not giving us this idealistic solution. Worry about nothing. Just trust the Lord and everything's going to be great. That is that is trite, I believe. And I don't think it's fair. It's dismissive and condescending to people to say, well, just don't worry about it. Right? I think we need to be patient and we need to be patient with ourselves and realize that this is a flesh spirit battle. I have to be sure, is it, is it worthy of concern? Then I need to be concerned about it. But I need to be sure to not allow my mind to go into this, this abyss 
And it really is an abyss of, of, of worry and thinking through all these scenarios. And then likewise, I have to redirect myself to, to pray and to talk to God about it. And then I have to be able to try to fill my mind with the good things. But thank you so much for bringing that up because it is a battle. And Paul, I believe, is talking about what he knows. He's not theoretically talking to the people. Paul understands that this is a battle. Anybody else? It's beautiful. Anyone else have a comment or a question about what we've talked about? Okay, if not, let me just sort of transition towards the end here. So as we get to the passage here, um, where anxiety, I think we all know anxiety and fear, what it does to us. There are two different times in verses four through nine uh, where Paul uses a word here that is actually the antithesis of anxiety or stress. See if you can find the word. Just take your time. But it's uh, verse, um, verse 7 and verse number 9. There's a word that's really the antithesis of anxiety, worry, and fear. Paul uses it two different times. Danielle just typed it up. All right, Dick and Shirley. Got to mute yourself. Can you unmute yourself, Dick? There you go. Only oh, thinking got uh, uh, peace of God. The peace of God. So in verse number seven, Paul says, uh, worry about nothing, pray about everything, and the peace of God that transcends. Now, the word transcends literally means above and beyond. The peace of God that transcends all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds centered in Christ. So in other words, what Paul is saying here is there is a peace. Arene is the Greek word there is a peace that is able to transcend your circumstances. There is a contentment, a calm that God can inject into our lives that is not proportional to what we're facing. Now think about that. Anxiety often feeds fear and nervousness inside us that is greater than the issue that we're facing, right? I told you that. Research shows that, what, 78% of the things we worry about never happen. 15% never as bad as we think they are. So anxiety often feeds these negative emotions that are not proportional to what we're actually going to face or are facing. On the other hand, Paul says, when you cast your cares upon the Lord, when you, when you choose to try to fight the battle in your mind, not to worry, and then you choose to redirect your thoughts and you pray about everything, the peace of God that transcends, it supersedes. There's a peace that is available to you that supersedes your circumstances where God can give you this supernatural sense of peace to keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then in verse number uh, nine, it says, whatever you have learned or received from me, put it into practice and the peace of God will be with you. So when we have peace, uh, we're much more relaxed. Our mind is more relaxed. Our body is more relaxed. We sleep better. We feel better. We're more positive, right? And really, the, the opposite of anxiety and fear is peace. And Paul says this peace is available to you, but you have to choose to worry about nothing, think about everything, or think about the right things, and pray about everything. But here's the key word. What's the key to all this? The key is found in verse number nine. What do you think it is? If you want to have peace as opposed to anxiety and fear, look at verse number nine. Here's the three big words, and you can circle these. Put it, or actually four words, put it into practice. That's the hard part, isn't it? Put it into practice. Catch myself thinking these thoughts, try to stop myself and say, listen, I can't focus on this. 
choosing to stop and to actually engage the Lord and to cast all my cares upon him, choosing to fill my mind with the right things, which may be choosing to eliminate things that I may enjoy, but tend to get me worked up. I have to choose to eliminate certain negative things in my life and choosing to fill my mind, reading the right material, memorizing scriptures, talking to edifying friendships that keep me redirected. Think about the right things. We have to put it into practice. Danielle says her translation says, keep on doing. Keep on doing. Put it into practice. And that really is the key. I'm going to look it up here right quick. Uh, give me one second here, whatever you have learned. Yeah, so learned is uh, to be taught. It's a, it's a custom or a practice. Um, and then uh, seen in me, Paul says, put it into practice. To practice is to execute, to perform, uh, to, uh, to obey, um, yeah, to fare. So yeah, so anyway, put it into practice. That's what it really comes down to. That's the, uh, the challenging part for all of us, okay? Any other closing questions or comments? Uh, we're at uh, almost an hour today. Any uh, final comments before we wrap up? Lita? I have one more thing to show you. We recently purchased this to put above the guest room bed. Can you see? Uh-huh. Give it to God. <laughs> Give it to God and go to sleep. That's yeah. great. So that's in the guest room. <laughs> that's good. So in other words, when John gets kicked out, you're trying to give him some edification before he goes to bed, right? How did you know? You're so perceptive. <laughs> <laughs> I'll figure it out. <laughs> He's speechless. <laughs> How about speechless. that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Anybody else? Any other comments or questions uh, you have about our lesson today before we wrap up? Trying to go through to see if there's everybody here. Nobody? All right. Very good. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, what we'll do, like I said, next week, we're going to look at the end of the book. We'll talk about contentment a little bit next week as we wrap up our study on Philippians. And uh, then we'll take a break. So next week, if you have um, if you have questions or comments about anything you've read so far in the book of Philippians, you can bring those to me next week, and we'll try to address those. And if we have to have a shorter uh, lesson in two weeks to sort of wrap it up, we'll do that. But otherwise, we'll plan on finishing our study next week. Uh, if there's nothing else, what we'll do is prepare to wrap up here. And uh, can I have a volunteer? Somebody want to wave a hand and offer to close us in prayer? Dick, Dick, very good. Dick Kestricky. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for being with us every day. And today we'd ask you to, to please help us focus on, on our gentleness, on, on being gentle, gentle in a loving way, in the way, in the way you would have us be. And uh, help us to, to put aside those those uh, those concerns we would cause uh, call worry the the anxiety help us to 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 lovingly understand what we can deal with and and uh, affect consequences and what we have no control over at all and that's that's what we want to to take out of our lives and and we know we can't do that without your help and we ask for your your assistance in that manner and now we just ask you to help us live according to your will today and in the days ahead. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dick. Well, God bless you all. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. And um, those of you here in, uh, in Arizona, uh, I'll uh, assume uh, that we're going to finish online next week unless you hear otherwise. We'll try to put it in the email updater if I'm going to be able to meet live at the church again. Uh, but otherwise, we'll just plan on... Um, on being online again next week only unless you hear otherwise. Okay. So very good. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a great, great day. Bless you.